Welcome to Romero Records Virtual Cast. Today we have on Julie Talton. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. And for everybody who doesn't know, uh, you were my, was it 10th grade, like biology or anatomy or both, maybe both? Probably. Yeah, both. Probably both. Probably both. So yeah, um, you and, were a great kid and a great student. So and I'm not being paid to say that. You, you really <laughs> were a great student. So I don't know if you remember giving me a keychain that said Jack. Oh, yeah. you remember that? <laughs> Do you remember that? It, I had it on my school keys forever. I always keep things with kids and I have things on my desk that kids have given me. And I had it on my keychain forever and it broke. And I don't know where it is now, but yes. So I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I, I do. That's crazy. <laughs> yep. Um. So yeah, you are now, is it principal of the whole school? Principal of the elementary school. Yes. The elementary school. So I taught high school and now I'm in elementary world with little kids. Okay. Okay. Cool. And and that's something that has definitely uh, separated itself since I was in high school. Like it was Aniana City School, really. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. it became elementary. Is it middle and high school? Yes. Okay. We created a middle school, I guess, about 10 or 11 years ago. Mm. So I guess it was two schools and then it went to three. So yeah. Okay. Definitely so changed a little bit. So you you actually came to Aniana from from where? Pinson. I was at Pinson Valley High School as a teacher, and then I came to Aniana to teach. Okay, and and I guess kind of give everybody you know for all the people who are going to watch this who are uh, maybe in high school or or college and want to become teachers. I guess give everybody like your your route of how you got to where you are. Um, it, you can take as long as you want or as short as you want, but um, yeah, just like kind of, you know, what you were thinking in high school and, and why would you go to college for what you did, where you went to college and and all that good stuff. When I was in high school and even college, I don't think I really knew what I wanted to do. My Both my parents are teachers and, um, you know, I'm not sure they really encouraged me to get an education. Even though education was a great um it created a great life for my family. Um, you know, my parents, you know, they were off with us in the summer and those things. Uh, my dad coached me in basketball. Um, but I went to um, a junior college and I played softball and I was on academic scholarship also. And then I went to UAB. Um, my goal when I started, I kind of wanted to teach medical school. I wanted to go to medical school and teach medical school. So I think teaching was still part of it. Um, even in all my college, like even when I was getting my degree, um, I still did. I taught like summer camps at UAB and those things. Um, but I have a actually graduated with a biology degree and a minor in chemistry. When I went to UAB, I wasn't really, I thought I probably wanted to teach, but at that point, changing your major, you know, is going to add a year or two. Um, and at the time, and which is still the case, math and science teachers are extremely hard to find. And um, so I graduated with a biology degree and then got a job a month later with no education classes. I'd had about a week of an education class. So I enrolled in their fifth year program to get my master's in secondary science education. And uh, I think I was hired like July 6th or something like that. And then I started teaching in August and got my education classes while I was teaching. Um, I never student taught. Um, my student teaching was real teaching. Um, but, you know, I was, like I said, I was teaching high school science. I, my first year I taught physics, which was very, um, I guess, overwhelming and um, intimidating. Some of those kids, I'm like, y'all are smarter than I am. And um, <laughs> then um, I taught physical science and biology. And I eventually ended up teaching anatomy and biology and honors biology and those things. So um, that's how I ended up teaching. I got my fifth year degree. I finished that in a couple of years. I stayed at Pinson for about um, five or six years. And then I ended up coming to Aniana um, here and I taught here for a little while. Um, and then I decided I wanted to uh, pursue school administration. So, and some people ask why in the world would you ever want to do that? Um, but I just felt like that's what I wanted to do. I, you know, in high school, I was always like in like student council officer, class officer, those kinds of things. So like just being a leader is kind of something that I've always just, it's, that's always been a part of me. And so I want to do my admin degree. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a principal or what I wanted to do. Um, so I actually came out of the classroom, which is really kind of odd and went to central office where I did curriculum. I was a curriculum director. And um, then I also ended up being technology coordinator for the school system. 
And um, at that time, we went one to one um, with our with Chromebooks with our students. And so we started that Chromebook initiative there. Um, I stayed there for a little while. Then I decided uh, I just I really wanted to school administration and I miss the kids. I miss that kid part of that. I was like on year 13. So I just um, I, that was just it's like I was teaching in my classroom and then all of a sudden I'm in central office and I don't have a lot of contact with kids. Um, so I really wanted to school administration. So I ended up um, coming to the elementary school here as assistant principal, even though I stayed technology coordinator, too. So we were running a one to one initiative with our school. We started that in seventh grade. Um, then I went, uh, so then I would do assistant principal job too. Um, then after I did that several years, a position came close, came open for a principal position that's actually very close to where I live because I live about 30 minutes away. Um, and I stayed there for three years. And then the principal job here came back open. And I have been here for um, five years, about to start my sixth year back here. So um, kind of a crazy turns, but um, I'm also like a seven-year itch person, so about every six or seven years, I'm, I'm going to want to do something different. I like to learn new things, and um, so it's that every six or seven years, you see me kind of like, okay, what's next? What's next? And um, that's kind of how I've ended up here, so. And, and honestly, I, I do want to go back and like talk about <laughs> everything you just talked about, but <laughs> that last thing you said is it kind of makes me realize, I guess, why I liked you a lot as a teacher. <laughs> Is because like, I, I think I could tell that about who you are and just like, you know, you, even you just saying like the leadership skills that you have and the, the instinct that you have for it. And I'm the same way. Like yeah. I, yeah. after so many years, I just want to do something else. And then yeah. I want to do something else because I think about how finite life is and I'm only on this planet for so long. And to say, you know, I want to do this and then just do that for forever and then retire mm -hmm. and then do nothing. That sounds so boring to me. Yes. I just want to do so many different things, but I had no idea about the the technology thing that you were doing and, mm -hmm. and all the other stuff, but it, it fits you though. Yeah. I like, I like a challenge. Um, I know COVID was a terrible time, of course, for um, everyone, you know, it's just a, a horrible thing that we had to go through. But as far as school, like for me, it's a challenge. Like, how are we going to come out of this and be okay? And as far as our students go, our students came out of COVID even with some growth. Like they didn't have a, a lot of falling back. Now we fell back some in math. Um, I have a philosophy about that. I think at home, you're more likely to read. Um, even when the kids were home doing schooling from home, um, you know, parents are reading to them and they're, they, they read. I mean, it's just part of their day. But it's very rare you sit down and say, hey, let's do some math problems, you know, <laughs> let's let's look at some charts and graphs. Um, but, you know, for me, that was a challenge. And I felt like that we came out of that pretty well um, in relation to how some people did. And, you know, so for me, I'm like, okay, this is a challenge, game on, <laughs> you know, so um, we can make this happen. But I'm just, I'm with you. I'm not a stagnant person. And if I ever feel like I'm getting stagnant, it's like, okay, what am I going to learn? What am I going to do next? Um, because you're right. If I'm not sitting here making a difference, then really, what am I doing? So, yeah. So uh, you make the decision and you start playing sports in college mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and while pursuing a degree, how, how was that for you, I guess? And, and also, how was that for you back then compared to see how you see uh, college athletes now and what they're having to go through? Well, now it was junior college, so don't I'm not like some big <laughs> college athlete or anything. It but was junior college. But you still were an athlete. <laughs> I still got to play. Um, you know, uh, it's very different than it was in high school. I went to high school in a very small town where everybody cheered for you. You know, your sports people, they're your heroes, you know, and the gym is packed every time you go to go into a junior college to play softball and nobody comes to the games, you know, and it's 365 days a year and so it's very very different um you know for me I didn't really because I was on academic scholarship and athletic scholarship I really didn't have to play you know so it's almost like a choice um but my I just my I gave my daughter an example she's um at Jacksonville State right now and she's um she was a good basketball player and she had the chance to go somewhere and I said I need you, I need to be real with you about what that's like. And, you know, and we'd always, you know, stay, you know, keep your grades up, all those things. 
And so she did. And, you know, when it came to the choice of, do you want to play or do you not want to play? I'm like, I need you to understand it's 365 days a year. It is a job. You are working for that. Like it is, that is your life. And if that's what you want, we're college, that is perfectly fine. But I want you to know what you're getting into. Um, but luckily she kept her grades up and then she was like, nope, I think, I think my basketball career is done. So she plays intramural basketball. Um, she called one night, said they won or no, they had lost by a couple of points. And I don't even know what the score was, 42 to something, 40. And she said, but I had 32 points. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so oh I'll take that. And so she's just having a good time, you know? Um, so I think, I think there's positive thing. you know, sports are a great way to get people, you know, get you an education. So you're not in debt, you know, um, I think that's great. Um, it is a lot to balance, you know, you, know, you have, and I, we, I know several people who've like gone to play softball or basketball and like, if they're wanting to do nursing or something, a lot of times it comes, they have to choose because are you going to do your clinicals or are you going to play sports? Um, and so, you know, I, I, you see that happen. And so does that change what somebody wants to do? You know, I don't know, but, um, for me, like I said, it was, it was just junior college. It was not anything big. <laughs> and so, well, uh, well, still, I, I do respect the fact that you were able to do that. You know, I, I didn't play sports in, in college and I had to make that decision too. I was like, yeah. do I, I ended up going to JSU and mm -hmm. uh, my dad, him being retired in the military at the time, Alabama, uh, yeah. which they've changed it to having like, you have to have like 40% disability in the military. But um, at the time, my dad, since he was retired, I could go anywhere in the state of yeah. Alabama for free. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I just chose JSU just because I just felt like going there and yeah. uh, I didn't play sports or anything. But um, I, that was something that went through my head. I was like, do I just want to go to school and have fun? Yeah. And just get a, you know, do the best to just, get a degree or do I want to do the sports thing and try and do like the NFL? But I'm just like, I, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to try that hard at yeah. that. I don't really want to do, you know, I want to do other things. I don't want to be a professional football player. Yeah. And I think when you're in a small town, kind of like you were, and you go to a small school, kind of like my daughters too, they're involved in so much like they are. I mean, my youngest, she'll be a senior and she's in band. She plays basketball and she plays soccer. And so it is year round. And so college kind of gives them a chance to go like, I'm going to be a student, you know, but my daughter, she's at Jacksonville too. It's been a great fit for her. Um, and she has a job. She works at the rec center. She is in a sorority. She um, has a job with a marketing, uh, the a person who kind of does in-game entertainment so she works with her um she gets, keeps her grades up but I think all those experiences like in high school and being involved allow you to know how to handle those things when you go to college you know she didn't sink and you were kind of like that too you know when you're in a small town in a small school you do everything because that's what your friends are doing um that is your social um area especially when you're not in a, like a big city or something like that so yeah so um okay let's go to the next phase you're, you're teaching and mm -hmm. you said you just you just jump right into it. July six, you get the yes. job. Yes. And how how was that with the whole the physics things? Because that that always baffled me as teachers, especially young teachers. Mm -hmm. Like you're teaching a subject that you probably haven't been studying really that long, and now you're having to like be a hundred percent correct to these students, mm -hmm. these kids, and that's got to be. Uh, it's got to be a little nerve wracking, but still you have to remember like, you know, they're learning too, but yeah. you do have some kids that are just like geniuses that you're in yes. class with. So like, how, how was that teaching the subject and, and just the experience of it? Um, I think I was probably doing more homework than they were. Um, <laughs> I had had some physics classes because like I said, I have a biology degree and I have a minor in chemistry. And so I had had, I had had several physics classes, um, but Obviously, when you're the new person coming in and other people don't want to teach it, like, congratulations, you get this, <laughs> you know, and um, but it was OK. And there were probably a lot of tears that first year. A first year teacher usually does shed several tears, um, you know, but luckily the biology part of it, like I was good at that. Like that's what my whole degree is in. And so I was probably doing as much homework and working as many problems as they were. Um but you just, you just do it. Um, that first year teaching, like nobody can prepare you for that. Like it is, um, 
And that's one thing, like, I, one of my favorite things about my current job being a principal is mentoring those new teachers and letting them know you will survive. Um, and because you don't know everything, you can't know everything. Um, and then especially what I talk, because I taught AP Biology here. And um, I mean, you're teaching kids who are going to be surgeons and doctors and, you know, and it's like, y'all are geniuses. And sometimes you just have to, but that's part of the humility of it, that I don't know everything, but let's figure this out together, <laughs> you know? Um, or I can help you or I can find somebody to help figure that out. Like, I think that's one of the biggest things in education in general, sitting in my job, no matter what, you don't have to know everything, but you got to be willing to work to find it. And um, that is, you got to be able to work hard and want to work hard to be able to do that. So that's probably the best advice I ever got one time as I was coming to be a principal, my former principal, um, he said, you know, you don't always have to give an answer right away. You can say, let me see, let me look into that. And Sometimes when you look at a principal or a leader, you think, oh, I, you got to have an answer right now. And you don't always have to have an answer right now. So yeah. same thing with teaching. I, I think that's something that kind of separates itself when you have like the students that kind of struggle that aren't as like smart as the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are like really smart, it, it really separates that. Uh, I guess the feeling of teaching because you almost feel like you're working with a, like a colleague, like when you're a professor in college, yeah. you've got some kids in there that are going to be super, especially like who are in like their senior year or graduates getting their masters. Some of those people, you know, they're in their mid twenties and they're really smart. Like people like Zuckerberg, when he was like <laughs> in his twenties, you know, he's starting Facebook yeah. doing all these things. Some people are just, very much elevated. And so if you're a professor and you're in like your forties, you're, that's a colleague at that point. Mm -hmm. Like they aren't just some person who's just paying a school tuition, just trying to get by. Like that's, that's right. not a colleague. So you probably get that feeling a little bit in those mm -hmm. AP type. Oh, classes yeah. In oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, question like, cause those kids, I mean, I think sometimes those kids think differently and they're asking you, you know, and you're like, Oh, I don't thought about that like that, you know? Um, but just know like that mutual respect of like, Oh, I appreciate where your thought is coming from, you know? And, um, so you just can't, you can't be intimidated, you know, you just gotta know, like, really, I don't have to know everything. I've just got to be able to figure it out, you know? Um, but like I said, it's doing the work, it's doing the work before then to refresh yourself. Cause you can't remember everything, you know? And so being able to, like, okay, let me go look that up or let me go figure that out. So. What would you say is the biggest difference in um, going from course to course, like different studies, you know, doing biology, physics, chemistry, like, d are you noticing the curriculums that they're giving you are like, oh man, like the biology was much better. Like they, it was more detailed or the chemistry, it was way worse. Like, d does there seem like to be a big difference in there? Um, not really because, well, here being, I was the only, well, me, I had there were two biology teachers and like I was the AP biology teacher, was nobody else. So a lot of times I got to pick textbooks and stuff we got to use, but we really look at the standards. Um, and then because we, you know, we have our state standards that we teach from and those books just support those. And so, and, you know, in high school, especially when you're a content specialist, and because that's really what you are in high school, um, you are, you know, you specialize in your content and you know what you're supposed to teach, you know what aligns with standards. So just because it's in the book doesn't mean you always teach it, you know, like, no, we skip that. And then sometimes, I mean, always in biology, I'll, I use, I would take some of this like ecology, maybe we would do it at the beginning of the year, um, just to where things would fall. So, you know, you have some freedom to be able to do that, but definitely those standards drive what you teach. And, um, you know, when you have this, and one thing about here, like if I taught you physical science and then I taught you biology, I know what I taught you in physical science and some of the chemistry that's in that physical science is gonna relate to that biology. It's gonna be, you know, you're gonna see that again. And so you definitely see where those things interact or, you know, intertwine with each other um, to be like, okay, you learned this here. And now I know this was a standard here and I know we learned that here. And so now we're, this is why you had to know that. So, yeah. One of the things that I thought was just the absolute most hilarious part about school was brain dumping. Like, especially you saying that you like teaching different grades and whatnot, mm -hmm. and knowing you taught kids a certain subject and then like summer happens, they come back to class and they're in this next class and it's like 
yeah, we we just brain dumped everything that we learned previously. Now, some people, they're just, as we said, there's some kids that are just geniuses. They remember everything. Yeah. But like, I thought that was such a strange thing because it didn't hit me until somebody said, now y'all can't just brain dump this. And I'm just like, uh -huh. oh, yeah, we could probably <laughs> <Yes>. remember <laughs> this for yeah. forever. So <laughs> what is what are some things that you have noticed about kids uh, kind of remembering uh, things chronologically, you know, as they go through their grades and, and how people have to uh, kind of adapt, like teachers have to adapt to like, what do they remember? Do I need to reteach some things? Yeah, we do. Okay. Well, there's a lot that goes into that. So currently we do summer reading and summer math camp for some of our um, students who may struggle a little bit more. Um, and that is to keep them, you know, so they don't have that summer slide as well. You know, that's what we call it down here is like, you don't have that summer slide. So we don't need to, you know, so we, how, how do we support that over the summer? Um, we also do assessments, you know, at the beginning of the school year to sit in elementary school to see, you know, what do you remember? What do you, you know, where are we struggling? And those assessments tell us you've got a gap here. You have, you know, something that we need to address here. Um, but I mean, it, it's definitely real. Um, you know, we encourage our, you know, kids and our parents, you know, read during the summer, do those things. So you just keep your brain fresh. But it, it's definitely real. But also as part of teaching is trying to make those connections real world to connect to something else. Um, you know, I don't when I taught biology, I would there was one when I taught photosynthesis, there was this and I would always try to teach 10 or 15 minutes and let's do an activity or something and then 10 or 15 minutes and do an activity or something um, just to break it up. And you probably don't even remember or knew that I intentionally tried to do that. But um <laughs> trying to make those connections but like I said there was one time that I would teach photosynthesis and I'm like I'm going to need your attention for like 30 minutes so what are we going to do we got to have your attention because I need to tell you this before we can do something with it because it wasn't a you really can't break up in the middle of photosynthesis and um but just trying to find ways to make those connections um you know either funny stories, uh, whatever. Um, in elementary school, we do a lot of multi-sensory instruction, especially when we're teaching to read. So um, our kids may be writing letters in sand trays because if you can um, connect to more than one sense, two or more senses, it makes a, a better connection in your brain. Um, and so, you know, crossing your body to um, write letters and air write letters. And um, so we, there's been a lot of study lately in science of reading. And so how important that multi-sensory instruction is getting up and moving, um, just engaging your senses to, so that you make those connections. So you, it doesn't all just fall out of your brain <laughs> right after you teach it. Um, you know, and that's why kids remember the things like when we build roller coasters, when we dissect animals, when we, those are the things you remember because they're multisensory and you're engaged in those and it's a real life connection. And so that is always a challenge as a teacher. How do I get this to connect with you so that you remember that? So, yeah. And, and I would say one of the biggest struggles for kids nowadays would definitely be the, the attention span. Like oh, yeah. we've seen, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. when I was in school, um, we couldn't have phones at all. Um, right. I think you could leave it in your locker. Actually, mm -hmm. you could leave it in your locker. Is, is that still what y'all do nowadays? Yes, that's still still the case here. But, you know, everybody's got a Chromebook. So we're one to one kindergarten through 12th grade, um, seven, six through 12th can take their Chromebooks home. We just have them available in the classroom. And really over the last probably year or two, we've had a huge conversations about we use a program um, to assess our kids and they're um, they they have a like an a learning path that's very individualized. And so there's they spend like 10 minutes on it a day, 10 in reading and 10 in math. And we've had lots of conversations about, you know, letting that be our 20 minutes of technology a day. Otherwise we need to try to get kids off technology. You know, it's not a babysitter um, because there's so much technology that they're, that they get when they get home or outside of the school. And that is, um, you know, that's, that's kind of a challenge of how do you balance those things? So. Yeah. And I think as parents and, and teachers, you have to realize it's a, an assistant. It's not really a replacement. Or absolutely there is nothing that replaces a good teacher an effective teacher and um I, I say that all the time it's people over programs um people over technology 
you put your money and your training and your teachers, nothing replaces a good teacher. Um, because especially what they do in elementary school, I've got amazing people in this building and, you know, they are working with this kid because this kid doesn't know the letters T, U, and B, but this kid over here, they do know all their letters, but they can't blend their letters together to make a sound. It's like they know every kid and exactly what that problem is with that kid and they're addressing that and there's nothing that can replace that. So. In, in um in sports they say it's sometimes it's not the X's and O's it's the Jimmys and Joes. So <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Yes, sometimes you are, it's you can have the are. the best system, but yes. if you don't have the right people to to train that system, then it's not going to do well. You are exactly right about that. It's definitely having good people, um, and then also like a parents here are super supportive and. Um, they value education. Our kids will come to school ready to learn, wanting to learn. Um, you know, it's just all those pieces have, fall into place. And, you know, it's, this is a great place to be where a lot of people, um, they they love these kids and they want them to be successful. And, you know, for me, teaching high school and seeing that end of it lets me see how important it is down here in the elementary world. Because this right here is the foundation for if kids are going to be successful academically, if they have their attitude towards school, because if you're not successful in elementary school, what are you going to do when you get in middle school and your hormones are crazy? You're really not going to like school. Um, so it is, um, you know, just, I feel such a sense of urgency in what we do in elementary world, because it does affect the rest of your life. You know, when I came down, when I came here from high school, I'm, I'm having conversations of, you know, like if kids were being retained or what, I'm like, they, they can be retained once, you know, we, we can do that, but definitely not retained twice because you retain them twice. That puts them 20 graduating high school and they're going to drop out of school. Like research tells us that they're going to drop out of high school. And so looking at that education system from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade to post-secondary, are we, are we, transitioning our kids well to the real world are we giving them the skills they need but it starts when they walk in this door and we have kids walk in here that are four because you know you don't have to turn five until september 1st um but we'll have kids walk in here that are four years old and the day they walk in here they're you know they we are determining mm -hmm. you know we're a huge factor in determining their school success yeah so it, it's a definite sense of urgency there so did you say you've been at Aniana uh, since you got there? Like you, you haven't moved schools? No. Well, I went to um, Margaret Elementary um, for three years. So I actually I came here in 2005. Uh, in 2016, yeah, I went to Margaret to be principal. And I was there from 2016, 2019. Then I came back to Aniana to be principal. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what... What would you say are the biggest changes that you've seen in Aniana since the 2005 entry until now? Um, probably, te well, that probably fit several things. Um, technology is, you know, it's just changing. I mean, you know, it changes all the time. And, you know, I've, I know 25 years sounds like a long time to some people, but when I started teaching, I was riding on overhead projectors, you yeah. know, and I was kind of like, next level because I would go into the um, computer teacher's room and I would type my notes on um, Word and then I would run them off on transparency so I didn't have to rewrite my notes all the time because I could just make notes on the side. So I was like cutting edge. <laughs> so, I mean, you got to think where we've come from and now I have Promethean boards in every single classroom and every kid has a computer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so technology is definitely, which, you know, causes you to shift some things. And um, sometimes it makes you question like, you know, do I need to teach this the same way? Um, because you have to question yourself. Like, do I memorize the, like, is there times that like kids have to memorize the periodic table? Maybe not here, but somewhere. Am I always going to have access to the periodic table? You know, like, cause I mean, I can find it in about 10 seconds. I can find it on, you know, on my phone. And so I think it makes you question like, how do I teach my kids how to know whether information is accurate? You know, it's correct. It's, um, so I, I think that's definitely a challenge for teachers, too. Um, I think how we serve kids and seeing kids as, um, you know, that whole child um, initiative, really focusing on their social emotional learning as well as their academics. Um, I think we take a now there's a huge focus on um, 
if a child does not feel safe, if they're not fed, if they're not going to learn. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we do breakfast in the classroom. All of our kids get free. We do that community education program. So our kids, um, they all eat lunch and breakfast for free again this year. They did that last year. Um, because if you come to school hungry, can you learn, you know, no. And, um, so our kids come in in the mornings, they get breakfast, they take it in their classroom, they eat, they have about 20 minutes to eat in their classroom. It's a great time for their teachers to say, Hey, how are you doing today? You know, just to kind of touch base with everybody. Um, we have full-time mental health therapists, um, here. Um, can we actually have two here, um, at our school. So if we have kids that are struggling and need therapy, um, or counseling, they, we have beyond our school counselors now, um, you know, it's just, I think looking at where used to kids came in, it's like, okay, you're here, you're here to learn. This is what we're doing. We're doing academics, but now we do so much other stuff to make sure that they're ready to learn. Because like I said, kids can't learn if they don't feel safe and if they're not, you know, not fed, you know, and just don't feel like they can be, they're, they're taken care of. So, you know, safety is also a huge thing that's changed. Um, you know, when I first started, People came in the building all the time. Now it's very, you know, you check in the office and that's just the results of school shootings and those kinds of, you know, the those terrible things that happen. Um, but, you know, those are those are three huge things. But I feel like it's just kind of just I, I feel like it's better. You know, I don't feel like anything is um, negative. I feel like we're just doing more to serve our kids and knowing that serving all aspects of our students and our communities as opposed to just meeting their academic needs. So, And as somebody who went to that school and just being from small town Alabama and then like going the places that I've gone, like I meet all these people. Like I've got friends from Texas who went to like <laughs> big schools in Texas. And like, yeah. yeah, when we went to McDonald's for lunch and I was like, what? <laughs> what? Like you, what? you left the school? <laughs> what are you talking <laughs> So it's it's cool hearing you talk about like having these mental therapists and kids getting to eat breakfast there and all these things. I'm I'm very excited and, and proud of the city to be able to do those things because they didn't have that when I was there. So no. it's, it's great to see the advancement. Mm -hmm. And like breakfast, if kids have to go to the lunchroom, they're less likely to eat. But if they eat in their classrooms, they'll go get it because their friend is going to get lunch, you know, or going to get a breakfast and um, just making it just accessible, um, I guess, to everyone, um, you know, and then I don't know, like I said, but just how what can we do to help our kids? I mean, and we do um, we do backpack buddies, which are we partner with some of the communities to you know provide snacks and some of our children who maybe um, need assistance. Um, on the weekend so we send like bags of food home with them mm. um, there's just all kinds of things I mean like all kinds of things different ways that we look okay what's a need and how can we make that need um, for our kids um, and their families because you know education is important um, but we're also a very important part of this community um, and partnering to make sure everybody's taken care of moms and dads included <laughs> so so on that topic what are some things that you see that the school, it, it could be Aniana or just education in general mm -hmm. uh, that you see is kind of missing and you wish, you know, they had these things like, oh man, I wish, you know, all education could do this or do that. Um, hmm. Probably just, I think the parent or the community and school involvement with each other. You know, we do things um, like we have events and some of those things and, you know, the participation is not that great, but parents are busy, parents are working and it's hard to find a time to make that connection. Um, you know, I heard this, I went to um, TASRO, which is our school resource officer conference is a safety conference. It's in um, South Alabama every year. And it is a phenomenal conference. Um, this year we got to hear um, Frank DeAngelis, the principal from Columbine and um, we got to hear him um we, we just all kinds of just phenomenal speakers um tall cops on there he's phenomenal um but uh there was a psychologist I can't remember her name right now but one thing that she talked about was just the technology with kids and um was saying that she sees kids who are bonded with their technology more than they are their parents mm. and that broke my heart and so like um she said because what will happen is when kids get upset especially like toddlers that that age like birth to five years is so important but um 
would say, you know, like a kid gets upset. Well, someone hands the kid a phone and then they're not upset anymore or a technology device. And so what those kids are learning at a very young age is that this is what calms them down, not their parents. And um, that is sad to me, you know, and but like letting I guess like letting parents know kind of what we know about, you know, what what do kids need to know to be successful in school? What do we need? To, and, you know, it's really not even that much. It's talking. It's sitting at a dinner table and you all sitting together and that kid listening to me and you have a conversation, how I pause and then you talk and then you talk and then I pause because those things that we take for granted, but we learn that by watching people communicate with each other. Um, that um, oral language piece, kids talking, you know, like just talking about what you're doing. I'm going to turn here. Or I'm going to, you know, like, what are you going to do next? Um, giving them two-step directions. But that oral language is so, so, so important. And like trying to just what could we do better? I wish there was a way that we could, a huge way where we could just get that to parents. I posted something this week on um, Facebook. If a kid knows eight nursery rhymes by the time that they're four years old, that they are some of the top readers in their class and the top spellers in their class. Um, but nursery rhymes are something that kids don't even do anymore. Like, I don't even know if my kid knows who Humpty Dumpty is, you know? Um, but we have a program here called Hegarty that we do. It's a phonemic awareness um, piece, but we do nursery rhymes in kindergarten now. And so many kids, they didn't, they didn't even know what nursery rhymes were. And it's not anything, it's just that we've replaced it with something else, you know? But some of those things are super, super important. So just, I think just knowing how important like talking to your kids are, you know, putting down the technology um, and, you know, the, just those kinds of pieces, how important that is at such a young age and can make them successful for years and years, you know, to, to come. I mean, just lays that foundation. So. Yeah. I think about that a lot when I think about how people grew up in school and, and what they did. I, I, I tell people all the time, I can, I can tell if you played sports, when you mm -hmm. high school or not, because I can see how you handle adversity. Mm -hmm. and I can see how you do well with others. Mm -hmm. and if you were on a sports team, you had to do those things. You had to handle adversity. You probably didn't win every single game. If yes. you did, then you just went to an amazing school, had an amazing team. And you, so you had to deal with adversity through that. And then you also had to deal with the adversity of, you know, am I the starter or not? No, somebody has to tell me I'm not the best. Like yeah. that coach has to make that decision to say, hey, somebody's better than you. So I'm going to put them out there over you. Mm -hmm. and sometimes kids, they they need that to be able to have that competitiveness in them. When you apply for a job and you don't get the job, how do you deal with that? How do you progress and become a successful person in society with with having adversity and having trouble? So, yes, yeah, school and having all those different communications as you said somebody seeing us talk then pause and letting the other person talk like those intangibles that mm -hmm. people need to have to have interview skills and be able to communicate with other people in their job and work with the team that's that's irreplaceable and, it is and foundational in elementary middle and high school mm -hmm. yes and I tell people all the time you know I interview people and you know people say what do I need you know, what do you want in a teacher or something like that? And I'm like, I need you to come to work. I need you to be able to work hard. I need you to be on time. I need you to be coachable. I need you to be willing to learn. I've got people in this building. I have a reading coach, a math coach, a reading intervention, math intervention. I, I have veteran teachers. I have people who can teach you the teaching part of it, but I can't teach those other things, you know? Um, and those things are, like you said, the intangibles. Of, can you write an email that is diplomatic, you know, um, because sometimes the things we have to tell parents are not fun, you know, um, but can you do that in a caring way, being direct, but be caring because there's, you know, there's a balance there. Um, but uh, yeah, those intangibles are, you just, they're, what do you, how do you learn those? You learn those, you know, just from day-to-day -day life and the experiences that you have in day-to-day -day life. So absolutely. Yeah. And, and it can be difficult for somebody, especially in your position, to be like, hey, what you're doing is it, is it what's I need and try <laughs> yeah. to like coach them through, <laughs> yeah. through what you actually are looking for. So I could definitely see how that could be something that people 
I don't know. They just might understand. And it, it might be different for, for younger people than older people, you know, like somebody who's in their fifties definitely grew up differently than some, than a mm -hmm. teacher that's in their twenties. Yeah. So they might grow like somebody in their fifties who's looking to start teaching uh, at a different school. They'd be like, well, you know, when I was in school, blah, blah, uh -huh. blah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> different. Well, the thing is like for us too, it's just all about the kids. It's, um, it's about what's best for our kids. And, you know, we have, we use data and I know that I know kids are not a number. I do know that, but we really do look at that whole child. We have meetings every month where we have kids that we talk about like, okay, so where are they here? You know, where are they with this and that? Um, but, you know, using that data to make sure our kids are making progress and that's, that's huge. And um, if you're, if you're all about the kids, you you know, you, you're going to do what's right for those kids. And I think being in this job too, it's like reflection, that self-reflection, I think with any job, that self-reflection piece is so important because you've got to be able to say, well, maybe I don't know well, everything about that, you know, um, maybe I, maybe there's a different way. And, but I'm always like, that. like I'm always changing. Um, we had something last year, you know, on awards day, we had too many people in the auditorium. And by the end of the day, I'd already made my schedule for next year. We're going to do every grade level at a different time. So like, you have to know, okay, this did not work. And now I'm going to fix it, but I'm a fixer. But I think in this job, you have to be a fixer. I'm a problem solver. And um, so you got a problem, we're going to fix it. <laughs> so so there's a, a couple of topics <clears throat> that I want to make sure that we hit. And one is um, the future of technology and, and schooling and, and how you do things. So I, I'll probably never forget this post, but a while back, it was some years ago, I posted, uh, you remember Shelby Taylor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I, her and somebody else uh, said something on my post and I was like, I'm shocked that y'all say it like this, but I said on Facebook, I think within, I think it was like 15 or 20 years. And I said this a few years ago that traditional college will be irrelevant. And the reason why I said that was because I think the way technology is advancing. And I said this before COVID and, um, we saw what happened during COVID everybody got laptops and was, learning from home. Um, but I was basically talking about how traditional college of you paying money to a university, showing up to that university, you know, however many times a week or a, yeah, however many times a week, and then learning from a professor, I think is going to change because mm -hmm. so many kids, um, are, are leaving high school and just either getting jobs right out of high school or doing, some alternative form of learning. We even have adults that are in their thirties and forties changing careers. Yeah. I just think that traditional universities are going to have to alter how they get people to come to their school because of all the alternatives that people have, like even companies. So you don't know this, but I, after I got out of the military, um, I got an offer to go to a a schooling, like a trade schooling, to learn how to put like 5G on telephone poles. So it was a company called Warriors for Wireless. And basically, um, I went, uh, I drove to Massachusetts and I stayed up there for two weeks. They put me in a hotel and they gave me food and I think they paid me as well. But I, I just learned on how to do this, this skill for two weeks. And then after that, um, companies came there to offer us jobs. And I got a job within a week of leaving that school. And then I did that for like a couple of months. And then while I was doing that job, some random company called Manpower Group offered me a job working for Rockwell Automation to work in the automation industry. And it's basically like, I'm um, a, they gave us the title of like instrumentation and automation controls technician. And basically we work with like engineers and doing working in technology to be able to do like troubleshooting in the, um, industrial industry. And that, again, they just randomly called me. I had to pass some tests. And then once I did, I went up there for three months and while I'm there, Week four, companies come and interview us to find out if they want to hire us. 
And then by week 10, it was like week 10 or 11, I had a job. That's so all I had to do is just finish the last two weeks. And now I work for Owens Corning, the shingle manufacturer, and making the most money I've ever made in my life by a, a milestone. Mm -hmm. And I, I lucked into it. They just called me and, and asked me to do that. So I say that to say my bachelor's degree in business management had nothing to do with the current career that I'm in right now. And it was all because of companies like Rockwell. They knew that people were going to retire in this career field. And so they were like, oh, let's just train people on how to work on the equipment that we currently sell to companies. And they created a school for it. So mm -hmm. I, I said all that to ask, how do you see traditional education um, altering within the future? Um, I'm kind of with you on that. I think, um, okay, so like I have a daughter in college, you know, so I see that too. And I know that she's taking online classes this summer and she needs a professor, you know, like now she's done fine in them, but um, as far as like what she's learning and retaining, I, you know, I'm like, yeah, I don't know, but she does better, you know, with that person in front of her. I think colleges are going to have, I think they have to have the options. You know, I think you've got to have, you know, the, because there are people at Jacksonville that she knows who are living in Tuscaloosa and they're doing all online on Jackson, at Jacksonville, you know, so they have that option too. They have options of night classes for working, you know, for working adults who need to take those classes at night. So I definitely think it's something that they're going to have to, um, you know, find those different options to reach those different people. But the expense of college is astronomical. And um, that right there is going to be your key, because if you've got companies that are willing to train you and you're not going to get in debt in college, um, that is, you know, we can get in a whole discussion here because, you know, people, you know, follow one way or another about forgiving school loans. Look, I don't, we're not going to get political on this, but forgiving school loans. But the problem is the universities the what they charge is ridiculous. I mean, you know, so yes, we have all this school loan problem, but when you really look at it, the problem is what we're what universities are charging for an education. And so because of that, I think companies are seeing that going, well, look, well, I'll just train you like I want to. I had a superintendent here when I went to central office, um, and he pretty much told me, and I maybe it was a compliment, I don't know. He's like, I'll, I'll hire people young and dumb, and then I can teach them like I want to teach them. You mm -hmm. know, he said, I need you to be able to work hard. Um, he said, I'm not saying you're dumb, but I mean, you're going to work hard and you're going to learn whatever I want you to learn. He said, I'm going to teach you like I want to teach you. And I think a lot of those companies like that, like, look, I'm not having to retrain somebody. I'm going to teach them exactly what I want to teach them. But I still think that degree is so important because I see a lot of kids. I call you a kid, sorry, but you're still a kid. When I teach you, you're always a kid. Um, but I see so many kids who are have a degree, but they're doing something totally different. But if they didn't have that degree, would they still be doing the same thing? You know, and that's kind of what I've told my daughter. Like she's doing sport management. She's minoring in um, photography. And I've told her, you know, that, you know, you can do your fifth year in education if you decide you want to go teach and coach, you know, whatever you want to do. But you have got, you know, like you just, you need a degree, you know, and then you can figure it out after there. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's definitely changing. And I think there's just a lot of pieces of that, that are, um, they're going to be changing in the future because it can't like college tuition cannot keep going up and going up, going up. You're going to end up, um, separating who can attend it's going to become an elitist um thing and i just uh and that that concerns me um you know as far as that goes because if you want an education i think you need to be able to get an education yeah so. and i and i think it started that way like mm -hmm. only the rich people went to yes. college back in the day when like mm -hmm. universities were founded and yes. it became we're like oh yeah just take out a loan like yeah. the, mm -hmm. the universities are basically banks for the yes. government <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. So there's, yeah, that's a whole issue there. We're living, I'm going to have two in college at one time. So for probably a semester, I'm like already worried about that now. <laughs> so, 
but I will say Jacksonville State, like you said, you went there. Um, it's it's a great university, and I, I and they have a great value for their education too. I mean, compared to some, and I mean that's what I told my daughter when she was picking. I said you can go to this college and you can owe a house when you get out, or you can go to this college and you can owe a car or less, you know, and I said, cars take three to five years to pay off. Houses take 30. So you decide, <laughs> you know, and um, so, you know, it's just, if you know, you can find a place um, where you want to go and, you know, of course, get scholarships and those things. But um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, <laughs> the whole college thing. So last thing is uh, still on Pretty much the same kind of subject is AI. Um, mm. How how deep into AI have you been able to to dive into, and have you been able to see it affect uh, the education and the skill level of students uh, at all? I, you know, I'm not in high school, and so I don't know if they're dealing with this with high school. Um, I definitely could see it being an issue. Um, I use AI on some things, um, like I, I'll use chat GPT um, for some things, like, and I guess because I'm older and I'm educated, I may say how to, I don't know, um, how to write an email to someone who didn't get a job, you know, or whatever, you know, something like that. And it'll send me something. I'll be like, okay, it kind of gets my brain fluid and then I'm changing it. Um, but where I can see high school kids going, write me a paper about <laughs> to kill a mockingbird. And then it spits out a paper. Um, I can see them turning that in and not, you know, making it their own, but it's going to be a game changer. I mean, just, um, I think we saw that this weekend with the, President Trump thing. I mean, you had pictures coming out and people, they were AI generated pictures and how do you know what's real and what's not? And it's a little bit scary um, on that road that we're going. So um, it's just, yeah, it's, it, I don't know, it's wild um, because I was looking, you know, reading all the news articles and it's like, this picture's fake. It's AI generated in this picture and whew, yeah, it's scary. And, you know, I think you see it, um, you've seen it in school discipline with people putting heads on inappropriate pictures, like the somebody's face on an inappropriate picture on a, you know, and it's someone else and they spread it around everywhere. And um, so you've got some discipline issues. There's just a whole lot of ethical things that um, I think that we'll end up having to address in the schools. It's gonna have to become a part of the curriculum. You know, like, you know, it's gonna have to become, this is a conversation we're having. When you were in school, it was plagiarism. Do not go online and find somebody's paper and turn it in, you know? And we had websites that did that, but I just don't even know, can we stay up with AI enough to catch it? Um, I don't know, but I still think it comes with the ethical piece of that too. Like you don't take someone else's work. You don't, you gotta do your own work. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's that right there is going to be, a, it's going to be very interesting. I'm hoping that I'm retired by the end. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and on to my next, no, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't see myself retiring too soon. So, so m my take on it is I think what AI does is it raises the bar. I think it separates the, the bad from the good or the good from the great. Yeah. Uh, so instead of telling kids, hey, you can't use AI on this paper, mm -hmm. make them have a really great paper. And it's yeah. like, you can, you can cheat all you want to, cheat <laughs> as much as you want to, but this is the standard. And you yeah. raise that bar mm -hmm. and they're like, oh. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, like an open notes test. Yeah. Tell a kid, hey, open notes. Take all the notes you want. You can use them during this test. But guess what? This is about to be the hardest test of your life. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's what AI does for kids. It's like, yeah. hey, just instead of telling them they can't use it, mm -hmm. make them use it and yeah. then raise the standard so that now they have to become a better student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, there's good to it. I mean, just like with everything, there's good and there's bad. And we just have to reframe the way we think about it. Like it's going to change how we think about that or, you know, what are some issues that we're going to have? And so it's just another it's just something else we're going to address. It's just like when we put Chromebooks in everybody's classroom and teachers like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? How are we going to manage this? You know, and you just, you learn, but AI being so new, it's, um, it's definitely going to cause some, and I would say in the college setting, um, it causes, uh, it's probably causing more issues than it is, you know, here right now. 
Um, but like I know my daughter's used it, you know, to you know, write an email to somebody she wants a job from, you know, but it's just a good way to get a start on something, you know, sometimes um just to say, how do I say this? Or sometimes like what's an and I know I can look up like the sorry sort of like what's another word for this mm. you know and it'll give me another a better word um but you know it's it's interesting so I, I think it I you know like I said I've used it some here and there but it's um yeah as far as school and that application in the school I think that's where you got to like explicitly teach like not everything on not everything that comes on Google is true not everything on the internet is true um being able to be objective in your reading and you're willing to learn and dig in because everything on AI is not may not be true either you know so you got to have some discernment and teaching kids that's important too just like teaching them everything else so well that's all I got for you um okay. is, is there anything that you wanted to wrap like that what you were just saying that was, that was a good wrap up right there <laughs> well yeah. No, I don't think so. I appreciate you having me. It's been good to see you. It's um, been been a long time. So glad you haven't forgotten us people here in Oklahoma, <laughs> Alabama. Um, and so I appreciate you having me. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and, and sharing, especially your journey, uh, how you got there. And obviously, you know, everybody can watch this, but I'm sure people who are uh, maybe some of your uh, students there, you know, high school kids, they're going to be able to watch this and be like, oh man, you know, that's crazy how she, you know, transitioned to all these different steps to get mm -hmm. to where you are. Because I think that's something important for, uh, for kids nowadays. It, the question was always, what do you want to be when you grow up? But I think it's kind of altering to like, what things do you want to do? Cause mm -hmm. you, you can do so much nowadays. There's, there's not one path. Yeah. I think that's important for, for kids to understand. But again, thank you for, for sharing all that. And I always ask kids too. like, I try not to ask kids, where are you going to college? Like, what are you going to do after you graduate? You mm -hmm. know, because I don't think college is like traditional, like you were saying, traditional college isn't always the best route for people. Uh, and people need to do what they're, you know, what they feel like their calling is. Um, and they need to, they need to follow that. So um, I'm, I'm with you on that. So what do you want to do? Or what do you want to change? What in this world do you want to change? What do you want to make better? Go do that, you know? So yeah. I'd recently posted that on Facebook. I said, instead of asking somebody, what do they do for a living? Ask them, what problems do they solve? Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Well, all right. Well, well, thank you again. And, uh, and I hope the best for your career. And thank you. you thank you so much. And you're doing a great job and I'm so proud of you. <laughs> good to see your former students doing good things. Awesome. So, thank you. All right. Well, thank you for everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye.